morning, everyone. Uh, so yesterday, we introduced another definition of acid and bases. Those referred to as the Bronze and Lowry definition. Uh, essentially, our Arrhenius definition of releasing protons or releasing hydroxides is a little bit too restrictive. The Bronze and Lowry definition sort of reframed these neutralization reactions as uh, the proton here uh, is an H+. Plus. Uh, I'm either holding on to the football, I'm the conjugate acid form, I'm going to donate the football over, I'm going to pass the football over to my partner. My partner who currently doesn't have a football is the base, and the base can actually be seen as receiving the football. So I'm just going to give you a quick practice question there um, uh, just to go over that. So let's just start off here. Let me hint at an equation. Let's start off with HSO4 minus. And that's reacted with CO3 minus 2. Uh, the question here is predict the products, right? Identify which ones are acids and bases. So um, predict products. And identify uh, your conjugate pairs. Remember, conjugate pairs were chemicals that only differ by a single proton, right? Uh, let's do this question first. So. Um, Naturally, this one here would be a very hard, but because we're using the bronze lowry definition here, we need to decide who's the acid and who's the base. I have to have one of each on either side. Well, let's start off with the CO3. This one here is a little bit more obvious. How would I know that the CO3 here is a base? Well, as a base, I currently don't have any footballs. I can't toss a football. I don't have any H's to give up. Right? I'm just going to sit there waiting for someone to pass me the football. This HSO4 minus, notice it does have an H, it does have a negative charge. That sort of hints maybe it could be amphiprotic. Well, since I'm reacting with something that wants to be a base, someone that wants to catch a football, then HSO4 minus decides, okay, I'm going to ask you to be the acid. Right? We're going to deal with the one proton transfer, and H plus is synonymous with the proton. Right? I'm going to pass the football over. The HSO4 minus is going to go down by an H, go down by a charge. That's going to become SO4 minus 2. The carbonate, CO3 minus 2, is going to pick up the football. It's going to go up by an H and go up by a charge, and therefore we're left with HCO3. I used to already be negative 2, and now I'm going to only be negative 1. Because we deal with bronsted lowry reactions, it is essentially just a one proton transfer. Right. Um, so now that we have the HCO3 minus as currently holding the football, potentially this reaction here could go uh, in reverse, so it could go the other way. If the HCO3 minus passes the football back, the SO4 minus is currently without the proton. It had already lost it. This is actually the base form, whereas the HCO3 is actually now the acidified form. So I predict the products just with a one proton transfer. Identifying conjugate pairs is essentially, well, HSO4 uh, minus and SO4 minus, those only differ by uh, one proton. And the CO3 minus 2 and the HCO3 minus, those are also different by one proton. Those are conjugate pairs. Just a reminder again, the conjugate acid form has the proton. The conjugate base form has lost the football. Um, sometimes they just ask you, uh, outside of a reaction, just can you identify for me what is the, so let's do here, uh, what is, or state, uh, the conjugate base of HC2O4 minus, and can you state the conjugate acid of um, PO4 minus 3? Right. So outside of an equation, what they're actually asking here, this hydrogen oxalate molecule here, again, could potentially be amphiprotic. It could give up the football and be the acid. It could pick up a proton. The proton will have a plus charge. I usually will gain charges until I'm neutral. While well, I have negative, I can become the neutral compound. If I ask you the conjugate base of this, that's telling you that this one here is currently the acid. That's telling you this one here has one extra proton. Having lost the football, what is it going to look like? Well, if I lose this H, I'm going to go down by an H, go down by a charge. This is just going to be C2O4 minus 2. That is the conjugate base of H, uh, C2O4 minus. If I ask you, what is the conjugate acid of this guy? I'm telling you, if this is the base, if this is the guy that's willing to wait for a proton, what does it look like? Um, how does it look like if I actually gain that proton? I'm going to go up by an H and go up by a charge. Phosphate used to have a negative 3, and now I actually have just a negative 2. Okay? So hopefully that clarifies a few things from last day. That's referred to as a bronsted lowry definition. We're going to mainly use the bronsted lowry definition for the rest of this chapter here. If you go on to chemistry, we actually run into one last definition called the Lewis definition. And in that case there, we get into more organic, we get into electron pair transfers. We're not going to worry about it in this course. Okay? In today's lesson, I want to introduce to you the whole notion of having different strengths. Okay? So 
Uh, we're going to come back to this table very shortly, but here's our keyword, the relative strengths of bronson lowry things being acids and bases. Um, notice that I have a big table here. We're going to come back and uh, analyze this in a little more detail. I just want to highlight for you uh, some of the vocabulary first. When I start talking about acid and base strengths, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, in everyday language, we refer to, oh, this juice is really strong, or this coffee is really strong. In that sense here, that's actually not the strength that I'm talking about. The words strong and weak are actually referred to something really, really uh, specific in chemistry here. Uh, strengths, it actually refers to uh, the uh, degree of ionization or the degree of dissociation. So you see, it's not necessarily sort of molarity. It's not talking about like, oh, which one's more concentrated or which one's more dilute. This one here actually refers to how far does the reaction go. Case in point here, if I have something that's strong, this is going to be what we're going to focus mainly on in part one of this chapter here. If something is strong, it is going to be 100% ionized. It's going to be 100% broken up, 100% separated. So what's going to happen here is for these ones here, these are just one-way reactions. So for example, HCl is a strong acid. So when you drop it in water, it's going to break out completely. In some sense, it does have to do with a little bit of solubility. While I know H plus salts are always 100% soluble here, this go to one-way arrow form H plus and Cl minus. What that says to us here is, upon dropping in water, water is so good at breaking up the H plus and Cl minus, you can have a container full of these ions, H plus and Cl minus, these guys really have no chance in going back the other way because the forward reaction is so good, 100% ionized. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to things that are weak. Well, if strong is 100%, weak can be anything less than 100%. Even if I was 99%, uh, I can say ionized or dissociated here, even if I was 99%, I would technically be weak because I'm not one-way arrow. It's actually going to be in equilibrium. But uh, case in point here, for most of the acids on our table, the weak acids or weak bases on our table, we're talking on the order of about maybe 5%. Right? So for example, acetic acid, so it's an organic acid. It has that carboxyl functional group there. This one here is a weak acid. So even though it is able to remove that H+, it is able to donate off a proton, pass that proton over, but it turns out, chemically speaking, it's not so easy to lose that H+. If I use a sort of box analogy here, let's pretend we have one molar acetic acid. Only a really, really tiny corner of this, only a really small fraction actually breaks out to become H+, and acetate. Uh, if I put numbers to this here, we probably are looking at maybe like 0 0.01 molar H+, 0 0.01 molar uh, acetate. At first, it may look like, wait, the mole ratio doesn't work anymore. The mole ratio is 1 to 1 to 1. In fact, the mole ratio is fine. For every little corner of this acetic acid, it's going to break out to form an equal amount, 0.01 H+, 0.01 acetate. Why I'm saying it's not working is I'm actually just giving you the total. I'm not telling you how much breaks up. Actually, by the time all of, uh, as much of it dissociates as it will, I actually have a lot of it stay on the side here. We're going to later on use sort of equilibrium constants here. If I had a KEQ for this expression, because this one here is an acid equation, I'm going to be calling this a Ka later on. The Ka we're going to see on our tables are actually going to be very small, 10 to the negative 5, 10 to the negative 7. Just like the KSPs were small, if I did a products over reactants then, for that fraction to be tiny, the predominant case here is actually stays on this left-hand side. So weak is referring to anything that's less than 100% ionized. We're going to actually end up in equilibrium, and this equilibrium, uh, we can say here, reactants are favored. Even by the time we've reached equilibrium, we actually have way more reactants than products. And that's why one molar, pretty much we're going to do an ice table this later on, one molar minus off how little actually breaks off. It's practically just one molar, maybe 0.996 molar, something like that. So it's going to be really close to one molar. Different story with strong things. Strong things, if I have one molar, this is guaranteed to rip apart completely. This guy is completely gone, and we get one molar H plus, one molar Cl minus. It's a lot simpler in the first part of this chapter here because we're going to mainly deal uh, just with one-way arrows. It's just 100%. Um, okay? Now, I did refer to sometimes in everyday language, we talk about, oh, the coffee being very strong. When you say strong in that sense here, I would prefer in chemistry to actually use the term concentrated. So concentrated, right? Remember concentration, C is equal to N over V. If something is very uh, concentrated, it means it has uh, high moles dissolved or lots of moles dissolved 
uh, per liter. Right? That's what ends up making your coffee very strong, your orange juice very strong. What I want to show you here is, so concentrated, I can have 12 molar HCl. The concentration part tells you the 12 molar. Yeah, there's a lot of moles that are actually dissolved, but HCl, chemically speaking, it breaks up completely. This is a strong acid no matter what you do. I can dilute this acid here way down. I can make this 0.1 mole HCl. In this solution here, well, it's not as concentrated as before. We haven't dissolved as many moles uh, per volume. Uh, we can now refer to this as dilute, meaning the molarity is very low. So a low molarity, you haven't dissolved a lot of uh, powder per liquid, but the HCl, chemically speaking, is still referred to as a strong acid. It still breaks up 100%. So let's try to be really careful in this chapter here. If you're talking about molarity, if you're talking about um, uh, how many moles have you dissolved in, let's prefer to use the language of, oh, it's concentrated or dilute versus strong and weak here. Strong and weak, actually, we need to look at the table. We actually need to refer to um, the ability to, for it to ionize. So with that, we can actually look at this table in a little more detail. What we have here is the relative strengths of bronsoloid acids and bases. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to tabulate acids down this left-hand side column. As an acid, you would expect all of them to have H's, so Arrhenius theory is releasing up H+. You'll notice that the equations have been simplified because I'm just telling you, yeah, HClO4, basically it breaks off, it releases H plus and ClO4. The HI breaks off, you become H plus and I minus, right? So all of these are acids, but remember H plus is actually, doesn't remain as a proton solution. We actually want to say something like, Oh, let's add water to both sides, and let's write the more complex equation. HClO4, in the presence of water, tosses the football over, becomes H3O plus and ClO4. That's the more complex case. As we get into part two of this chapter here, before we start setting up ice tables, I want to make sure you convert the simple into the complex form. Right? Now, what's happened here is we've actually ordered them based on their strength. We have a big arrow that says strength of acid goes up as I go higher. So we have increasing strength of acid. So the higher it is on this list here, the better its job. All the acid's job is to donate this proton here. I'm better at donating the proton the higher up I'm on the table. And in fact, the ones that are one-way arrows, you notice they're the strongest ones here. These one-way arrows here, technically these are the ones that I would refer to as strong acids. These ones here are 100% ionized, are 100% broken up. That means everything underneath it, I'm referring mainly just to the acid side right now. We'll worry about the base side later on. That means everything else underneath it, let me just highlight it. So down this acid column here, everything else underneath is actually weak. They don't break up 100%. They're not one-way arrows. We saw the equilibrium here. All of these ones here are technically weak acids. However, if you take a look at the equilibrium constant, well, again, we'll do another lesson on this Ka later on. But this equilibrium constant here tells you, by the time we've reached these equilibrium, do I have products favored or reactants favored? Notice all of them are tiny. All of them say reactants are favored. But the Ka relatively, this is a relatively big Ka, right? That's a 10 to the negative 2 versus something that's like 10 to the negative 7. This Ka is larger, which means the equilibrium can go a little bit farther than in this case here. So yes, overall, we're weak. Overall, it's not 100% dissociated. But relatively speaking, the higher up I am on the chart, I am a stronger weak acid when I'm higher up, or I am a weaker weak acid down below. Weak acid, definitely, because we're all equilibrium, but still, we're increasing strength going up this way to the extent when I actually breach that line there, uh, we actually go 100% ionized. So that's our distinction between strong and weak things here. I wanted to show you, relatively speaking, even though all of these bottom ones here are weak acids, uh, there can still be some that are better at doing their job. Uh, you can make a note to yourself here. These ones here are better at donating protons. Still weak. It's still not going to be 100%, but it's going to be better than anyone lower than it. A okay. couple other interesting notes here. Uh, you'll notice most of our strong acids, they're all one-way arrows. We'll come back to them in a second here. The sulfuric acid is the one example that's actually a diprotic acid. It actually had two protons to give up. For sulfuric acid, it is only strong in the first ionization. When I lose that first football, it's one-way arrow. I end up having HSO4 minus. I still have football to give up. 
the HSO4 minus I find a little bit later on, HSO4 minus by itself is in this weak section. It's still one of the stronger ones, but you notice that second proton is a little bit harder to break off. So sulfuric acid here is only strong in the first ionization, and you just basically look for, well, uh, this one also shows up down below, well, we're in the weak section here, the second proton is a little bit harder to end up give, uh, getting lost. We're going to be doing this in a later chapter here, a uh, later section here. If I compete, let's say um, we have H, uh, let's do HC2O4 minus here. That could be acid or base. And we have uh, HPO4 minus 2. That could be acid or base here. Because the HC2O4 minus is higher up on the table, even though both of these were amphiprotic, let me just hint at it right now. Let's say I have a reaction between hydrogen oxalate and HPO4 minus 2 like this. Unlike the warm-up question that we did, where it was obvious, oh, this one's definitely the base, this one's definitely the acid, both of these ones here are amphiprotic. Both of these have that um, hydrogen, have that negative charge here. Both of them can either be proton donors or proton acceptors. What we're going to be checking here is this table says, when I compare their acid strengths, when I compare who's better at donating the football, even though both of us are weak, the HC2 or minus has an easier time donating the football this one here is going to donate the football over, and that's actually going to help decide for us which way the proton uh, transfer actually goes. Right? So just uh, we'll do another lesson on that part there, but that's how you read the table. What about the base strength then? Well, bases are going to be, again, without the proton. Bases you can read on the right-hand side of the table. These are the conjugate bases of the conjugate acids here. If the acid is very strong, if the acid is very good at coming forwards, what are my chances of me as a base and actually going reverse? Well, if, for example, HIO3 here is a weak acid, but HIO3 has a relatively large Ka, HIO3 is very good at breaking off this H+. If I'm HIO3's partner and I'm IO3-, it is possible for me to go backwards because it is reversible, but because HIO3's Ka is actually very large, I'm actually not going to be as good as a base. So that's why the stronger my partner, the stronger, the higher up on the left side I am, the weaker I am as a base. And that's why the arrow actually goes in reverse. We actually have increasing strength of base as I go down. But I want to specifically mention here, this is talking about the conjugate base. I'm not talking about, oh, this one here is amphiprotic. This one, how good is it as acid or base? Its acid strength is given by the left-hand side. Its basic strength here is talking about the conjugate partner. If the HC24- is good at coming forwards, I have not a good chance going backwards. As my acid gets weaker and weaker, not that good at going uh, forwards, therefore my partner is actually better at actually coming in reverse. So let me just write that down for you here. If I have a stronger conjugate acid, meaning I'm higher up on the left-hand side here, I'm better at going forwards, stronger conjugate acids are matched with a weaker conjugate base. My partner has a little bit of a hard time coming back the way it came. As I get weaker, not as good at going forwards, my partner, my base uh, without the proton, is actually better and better at coming reverse here. Uh, unfortunately, our table only tabulates for us Ka's. They don't actually give us Kb values. Uh, we're going to do a link to actually calculate Kb. It's not super hard, but we'll do it in a later lesson here. We're actually going to see that the Kb strength actually increases going down. So not completely obvious right now, but we're actually going to have an increase in Kb. My partner, the right-hand side, the bases are always on the right-hand side here, my partner will have an easier chance in actually coming in reverse. Okay. Uh, we had qualified here strong acids, so those top six, right? Uh, in this case here, what about strong base? Well, the base strength is going to increase, increase as I go down towards the bottom right. Surprisingly, the strong bases, I only have O-2 and NH2-. These ones here are the only strong bases that I have. As a strong thing, it ionizes 100%. It also has a one-way arrow. We read base reactions right to left. This one here will generate our characteristic base particle, generate our ammonia here. Those ones by themselves are also bases as well. OH- is actually a weak base. Ammonia is actually a weak base. It actually is found other places on the table. It is only strong for the O2- and the NH2-. So in this case here, uh, because O2- is a strong base, because it one-way arrows forms hydroxide, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to include, in addition to O2- and NH2-, uh, any soluble salt, so it's 100% ionized, containing 
OH minus is also considered strong. So how about my NaOH that we did from before? I don't see that on the table. NaOH is not on the table because it's an ionic compound. It's not one of these sort of covalent groupings here. But NaOH, like the O2 minus, it one-way arrows, right? It goes 100%. It ends up releasing off Na plus and OH minus. I one-way arrow forms hydroxide, just like oxide. One-way arrow forms hydroxide here. Therefore, I'm going to include in my strong bases any metal compounds, any soluble salts uh, that contain uh, the hydroxide group. Right? So I just wanted to introduce you to this table here. We'll work more with it uh, in the upcoming lessons. Uh, a couple uh, features I want to uh, show for you here. Again, all these reactions here have been simplified. I'm just going to demonstrate to you again how do we go from simple to complex. This will give us a nice uh, connection with our ice tables later on in this, in this section. Let's take an equation. Let's take this one here. HF becomes H plus and F minus. On the table, so HF is becoming H plus and F minus. We were in the weak section. That's why it was in equilibrium. That means not a lot of this HF here manages to actually break off. Right? It's weak. We're going to do it with Ka constants later on. This one here on the table, it just says, yep, the simplified picture, simplified equation as an acid, I'm supposed to release off this H+. To get from the simple to the complex on the acid side, remember it was similarly, we would just add water to both sides. So add water, add water. Then I'll actually be able to see the HF actually passes this football over to water. Upon doing that, right, the HF goes down by an H, goes down by a charge. That's what leaves you with the F minus. And the water is going to pick up the H, pick up a proton, and that's what's ending up forming H3O+. So for the acid side, it's like adding water to actually get from the simple to complex. How do I do a base equation? This is getting into stuff later on as well. The bases are going to be on the right-hand side of the table. Uh, let's take this equation, for example. I have SO3 minus 2. I want to read it right to left. So SO3 minus picks up a proton, becomes H SO3 minus. When I actually write out the base equation, I'm used to reactions on the left-hand side. So let's just rewrite this here. SO3 minus 2 grabs a proton. I'm going to rewrite SO3 uh, minus 2 grabs a proton. It's in the weak section. So this one here is going to become H SO3 minus. That's what's uh, the simple equation on the table although it's right to left on the table, it's a base equation. How do I get from the simple equation to the complex equation on the base side? What we're going to end up doing, it's sort of like adding hydroxide. There's really no chemistry in that. It just basically helps us uh, get to our conclusion here. SO3 uh, minus 2 as a bronze lowry base is supposed to pick up a proton. Who does he steal the proton from? He actually steals a proton from water. The SO3 minus 2 is going to pick up, go up by an H, go up by a charge. That's what ends up forming HSO3 minus. It's actually the water that's actually going to drop off the hydroxide that's actually going to give you the characteristic base particle here. So on the acid side, it's like adding water. On the basic side, going from simple to complex, you end up adding hydroxide. Right? Uh, we're going to come back in a later lesson to talk about uh, ionization constants, how do I get base strengths, but I at least wanted to introduce you to this table here. Uh, one last note for today's lesson here. These strong acids, you'll notice they're all one-way arrows. Is there actually a distinction between, is HClO4 actually stronger than HI, stronger than HBr? It is possible you can mix a pure sample HClO4 and a pure sample HI. You could have a relative strength between these ones as well. But for us, we are always going to be in aqueous solution. We are always going to pretend we have already been dropped in water. So what's happening here is, if I drop HClO4 in water, it's broken up. Drop HI in water, it's broken up. Effectively, all these strong acids, they all go 100%. Basically, what water has done, water has uh, leveled these acids here. This, this is referred to as the leveling effect. Uh, since all strong acids, those top six acids that we have on the table, top left, okay, since all strong acids are 100% ionized, in water or in solution, we can say water has leveled them, water has made them equal strength. Water has made them all on a level playing field. Water has leveled them to the same strength. Okay, so it's case in point here. We can have HClO4 
that was our top left acid here. Water will 100% ionize it. It's going to break up H+, and then we're going to have ClO4-. The HClO4 is no longer to be holding hands. Let's compare to HCl. HCl is a little bit lower than it. Does that mean it's weaker? Well, no. Water also means it 100% breaks it up. Let's play fair here. Let's start off with equimolar. Just introduce that language to you here. Equimolar means the same molarity, so that it's actually um, fair to make a comparison. So same molarity. Let's say I have one molar uh, perchloric acid and one molar HCl. Just because HCl4 is actually higher up on the list here doesn't change the fact that water would have come in, separate off the H+, separate off the Cl-, effectively both of them will end up producing one molar H+, as well as one molar the other, counterbalancing ion. Those are typically going to be spectators. They actually have no chance in actually coming in reverse. So both of these solutions are equivalent to solutions of one molar H+, so both of them can be said they are actually equally strong. Again, I had mentioned it's possible to intermingle HClO4 directly into HCl. You could, in that situation, if there's no water present, you can argue one is stronger than the other. But since we are always in water, basically strong acids are always one-way arrows. If we have equal molarity, we are equivalent to an H+. In fact, we can actually say it this way. An H+, or an H3O+, H+, or H3O+, is actually the strongest acid that can exist in solution. Right? Well, wait a second. I thought the acid was on the left-hand side. I thought the HClO4 was the acid, or the HCl was the acid. Well, what's going to happen here is, yep, outside of water, the HClO4 or HCl were holding hands. When you actually drop into water, water has come in and dissociated the H plus and ClO4 minus. They're no longer holding hands anymore. HClO4 doesn't exist anymore in solution. So therefore, I know it's already very acidic because this one here was a strong acid. H plus left over. H plus by itself is an acid, but surprisingly, when you actually look it up on the table, even though these strong acids here all one way arrow to form an H plus, the H3O plus, totally big mess here, the H3O plus here is actually starting off in that uh, weak acid section. So H3O plus, I'm just going to borrow this equation on the table here. H3O plus here is outside of that strong acid category here. H3O plus is the strongest acid in solution, and it's actually a weak acid. One of the better ones, though. One of the stronger ones, though. So H3O plus, right, because the H is no longer holding hands with ClO4, I'm just going to rewrite that equation. H3O uh, plus is actually in equilibrium with H plus in uh, water. So that's why this one here itself is an acid, but itself is actually a weak acid, although it's one of the stronger weak acids. It's higher up on the chart. In the very same fashion here, if I have, let's say, I drop in uh, KOH, right? KOH here is an alkali salt. An alkali salt is going to break out completely. It's going to become K plus and OH minus. You're not going to find these ionic compounds on the table. Remember, we cheated a little bit here. Although it was only technically the O minus 2, that's a strong base, right? Even hydroxide is not a strong base here. It's the O2 minus down the base column. That's actually the strong base. A one-way arrow forms hydroxide. We had cheated and we said, oh, well then if I one-way arrow and form hydroxide, let's call you a strong base as well. KOH here as a, um, a soluble salt, also one-way arrow forms hydroxide. So we can refer to the chemical that does that also as a strong base. So again, water has completely separated the K from the OH. They're no longer holding hands. What is the strongest base that can exist in solution then? It's no longer the KOH. It's no longer the O minus 2. We only have OH minus. OH minus, in a similar fashion as you look on the table, OH minus can actually be refound. OH minus just happens to be the conjugate acid after the O minus 2 has actually picked up the proton. But OH minus is actually, you can find it on this side. On the base side, it again is outside of the strong category here. OH minus is actually a weak base. We know it from the equilibrium. The OH minus can then pick up an H plus and become water. So you can say sort of in parallel here, just like hydronium or H plus is the strongest acid in solution, OH minus, which is a weak base, OH minus is um, the strongest base that exists in solution. And that equation, I'm just going to borrow from the table, OH minus picks up a proton. It's actually weak and then reforms water. 
for the base. We look at it for the right-hand side here. Uh, Bronsolori base says it picks up a proton. It grabs a proton that steals from water, and it ends up reforming water here. So water has effectively leveled these chemicals because they're all going to be one-way arrows because they're not holding hands anymore. Um, it's just the leftover H plus and just the leftover OH minus. That's actually the acid and the base. All right. So uh, just uh, get some familiarity uh, with your table, and we'll pick it up from there more tomorrow. Thanks, guys.